Hi, I am actually a little bit nervous, and I never get nervous in public speaking. And I think it's because this group of people is amazing. And I am really happy to see all of you here, and really have to talk into this microphone, and I don't know why. Um, so I work at Twitter, and I do product safety engineering. Uh, specifically, my team is in charge of the login infrastructure at Twitter, in charge of two-factor authentication, password reset, and a few other things that are fun and exciting. Uh, so if you can't log into Twitter, you get to call me. Uh, <laughs> if you break your two-factor and you can't get into your account, you get to call me. Uh, these are like fun things. Um, I have one slide, and I actually, I can put it up. I don't have to put it up. I'm going to like just wing this one. Because this isn't about me, and this isn't about a presentation. It's about all of you. It's why all of you are here today. Um, all of you are here today because I actually get the honor of working in a platform that brought you all together. It was one tweet that went viral, and I am very, very happy to stand in front of you and have an opportunity to speak to all of you. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my background, because like many people here, I never thought I was an engineer. Uh, I grew up in, locally, I grew up in East San Jose. Uh, for those of you who are aware of where East San Jose is, it's not exactly the nicest place in the world. It's not the worst place in the world. It's not the nicest place. And growing up, I grew up in a mainly Hispanic neighborhood. And uh, there were Hispanic gangs, the Norteños specifically, they ran my neighborhood. And they ran me. And they would chase me and I would get beat up going to school, I'd get beat up coming home from school. So I started to hide. And one day I found my way into a computer store and hid there. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you said Leslie, you probably thought a woman was gonna walk up here. So imagine Leslie in the hood getting beat up all the time with that name and sitting in a computer store with other people who were a little bit odd and they were misfits as well. And they let me sit there and play games for a day or two and then they said, if you're going to sit here, you need to learn something. And so they started teaching me how to use computers and they started teaching me how to program in BASIC and Pascal. Uh, <laughs> long time ago, yeah, there are a few people who remember that. Uh, there were a couple of Macs in there, and they gave me this big giant thing called MPW with the Macintosh Programmers Workshop. And if anybody's over the age of 40 in here, you'll remember that. Uh, some of the hardest program you could ever do. Uh, I have all my notes on my phone. So, you know, I did my thing. I spent a couple of years there, you know, just hiding out. Um, said I was into chess boxing. I learned how to box because I kept getting beat up. And the fastest way not to get beat up is to go to a karate school or a boxing school, and then you don't really have to learn anything, but people know you went there. <laughs> so they leave you alone. But it's, you know, all of that sparked something in me about technology. I grew up in Silicon Valley. I was surrounded by it even though I didn't want to be surrounded by it. I remember a young Steve Jobs. I remember his up and down, his rise and his fall. Uh, I remember, you know, the, the ends of Atari as they were going out. So I was always around technology and I was never intimidated by it. Uh, but, you know, I got to high school, I discovered sports, I discovered the opposite sex. Uh, I forgot all about computers until I found my way into the computer lab. And s sat down and somebody says, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to like write a program for a racing game. It's just a text-based racing game. They're like, well, you've never taken a computer class. And I'm like, no, but I know how to use a computer. And they said, no, leave. So I left and went back another day and tried to sit down. And they said, you didn't take the class. You can't do this. I said, have you ever even taken a typing class? I'm like, no, but I know how to use this. I know what to do. And they told me to leave. So I hung out late one day and went in when all of the computer lab people were gone. And the only people left were the real nerds. <laughs> And they weren't going to talk to me because I was a black guy named Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> so they just let me stay there and I started teaching myself more. Um, but then girls, sports, trouble found me and I found it and we had fun and I got kicked out of high school. I didn't graduate high school, I got kicked out. Before I got kicked out, I had taken the ACT, I had taken the SAT, I scored something like 1300 and something on the SAT, and found some schools that took a chance on me. But because I didn't have the background, because I didn't have anything even remotely preparing me for college, 
I did horrible and dropped out. And so I'm 19, 20 years old, not knowing what I'm going to do, back in East San Jose living with my mom in our little 1,200 square foot house. Don't have to run from the gangbangers anymore because they have cars. So <laughs> that was, that was a, the good thing. They weren't walking around the neighborhood anymore. Um, and my mom says, you can either work or, uh, you know, or, or go back to school, but you can't live here for free. So um, I started looking for a job, didn't know what I was going to do. And I found myself uh, working as a security guard. And I started working as a security guard at Apple. <laughs> and uh, working the graveyard shift because I'm a night owl. And I would go through there and, you know, much like today, there are people there at 1 o'clock in the morning. What the hell are you doing here at 1 o'clock in the morning? We're programming. I'm like, I know how to program. I'm in a security guard outfit. I'm a black guy <laughs> named Leslie. And they're like, well, what do you know? And I tell them, and they're like, well, this is what we know. And they let me sit down with them, and they taught me. And they took the time. They didn't care I was a black guy named Leslie. They didn't care I was a security guard. They treated me like an engineer. So I did this for some time, and uh, was working like double shifts because it was easy money, and I was having fun learning. And I was teaching myself at just, I, just a tremendous clip. You know, I mean, programming on the Mac in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s was really hard. I mean, really hard. And so, but I was building up a skill set. But guess what? I couldn't get a job at a company because I didn't have a degree. I couldn't get a job at a company because I didn't have any work experience. But somebody took a chance on me. And they said, hey, why don't you come in and do this thing called QA? I'm like, what's QA? They're like, you test software programs. I'm like, I know how to write them. They're like, no, you don't. <laughs> but if you know how to use a computer, you can test. So I said, OK, fine. It pays. I'll test. So I tested for years, a lot of years. Um, but then I got really, really good at testing, and I kept programming. And I got really good at leading and managing and understanding the business. And then the dot-com boom happened. And I was at the right place at the right time. And I developed, helped develop the first ads targeting system for the web at a small company called Impulse Buy. It was bought by the proto Google called Ink to Me. I was, God, 20 something, tw early 20s. And I'm like, all of a sudden, I'm in the big league. I made a lot of money. I'm working in what now we call the cloud. I'm working on search engines. I'm working on things I never thought. And I'm like, this is like real. But I'm still not considered an engineer because I don't have a degree. And Ink to me, much like Google, much like Facebook, much like Twitter, has an elitist problem. If you're not from a particular school or a particular background, you're not really considered part of the club. So I said, I got to get out of here, find someplace else. So I started interviewing. I'm interviewing for engineering positions, engin for QA positions, QA director positions, engineering manager positions. I end up at this company called SocialNet. No one here has heard of it. <laughs> ah, one person has heard of it. I'm, I get there, and I show up, and I'm like, hi, I'm here to fix the copy machine. Yes, it's right down the hall. <laughs> no, I'm here to interview for an engineering position. So I go through the engineering you know, interview, make it through that hit the executives, I'm sitting in front of a guy, a little overweight, glasses, curly hair, Reed Hoffman. <laughs> this is Reed Hoffman's first company. This is what he wanted LinkedIn to be. Uh, I didn't take that job uh, because the other company decided I was worth something, started throwing money at me, and money talks. So, but it taught me a lot, and it also, unfocused me from what was important. Because I started buying into the meritocracy. I started buying into you work hard, people will recognize it, because people were throwing money and stock at me like it was nobody's business. It's like, this is amazing. I have worked hard. I deserve this. I'm as good as everyone else. So I put my head down. I started to work. And over the years, I was noticing a strange shift after the dot-com bust that the workforce was becoming very homogenous. 
there were fewer women, there were fewer African Americans, and that says a lot because there weren't a lot of us in the first place. There were fewer Hispanics or fewer everyone. And the Googles are hiring all out of the top schools, or what they call the top school. You know, you know, and Yahoo's doing it, and everyone's doing it. You know, but I'm like, I'm keeping my head down, I got stock options. Joined a company, got acquired by Google, you know, made some more, keep my head down. Uh, I am now accepted as an engineer. Not because I went to school, but because I had proved that I could last in the environment that someone created that they say that we can't succeed in because we don't have the pedigree. So I'm sitting at Google, enjoying my life there. You know, this is 2008, 2009, sitting on a couch doing some work, you know, like some of you who work there. And um, the director of my group comes up to me, sees me, walks by, stops, comes back, tosses me a book. Not a genuine black man. He's not black. That book is written by Brian Copeland about his life growing up in San Leandro. He's a black man. And the cover of the book is an all white picket fence with one black picket. He tells me, maybe this will help you get along better here. I, I, you know, you don't know what to say. You're like, I'm like, okay, if this were like 10 years earlier, I would have just like smacked the shit out of him. <laughs> <laughs> But you can't do that, unfortunately. So about two months later, I left and went to Apple because a lot of people I'd worked with previously uh, who were women, people of color, were at uh, the division I got at Apple. I was in at Apple. And I stayed there for some time and worked hard, had a good time. And then I left and came to Twitter. Twitter's a great company. It's a great company for the feminist movement. It's a great company for this movement. It's a great company for black Twitter and Black Lives Matter. <laughs> and it's amazing. But what Twitter does on the outside sometimes does not reflect on the inside. And there have been many events and many situations at Twitter where I am reminded that I am A, not an engineer, as some people like to say, and B, you know, that I'm actually, you know, a black person. And what has been happening for me lately, as I've sat and I've watched Ferguson over the last year, as I've sat and I've watched Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, and watched this platform that I work on, that I help people be successful on, really put a name to this, has changed me. I am no longer the person sitting down, putting my head down, working. I am out here because you all took a stand. You all said, I look like an engineer. You used my platform for something that is bigger than all of us. This puts in everyone's face that we are not some number, that we are not some statistic, that we cannot be tokenized, that we cannot be used as a, as a recruiting tool. And to that, I never do that. Anytime somebody comes to me and says, we want you to be in the company brochure, I say no, because I'm not your token. And I know that's the only reason you're asking me. It's a little bit emotional for me uh, because I really do love tech. I was born in the center of Silicon Valley. Uh, that has given me so much economic opportunity. It's given me so much personal opportunity. And I'm happy to share it with all of you. But as Wayne said, we have a lot of work to do. And the work is to hold people accountable, to hold our leaders accountable, to hold our companies accountable. You know, I look like an engineer because I am an engineer. All of you are engineers. You've proven that you're engineers. Don't fall into the trap of being tokenized because that is something that can and will happen. Don't fall into the trap of good job, good stock options, keep your head down. No, I, I've said this and uh, I'm probably gonna get in trouble with our press people. And this is, comes from my father who was involved with the Black Panthers when he was younger. 
White people only understand one language from black people. That's the language of disturbance. They haven't listened when we've talked to them. They haven't listened when we've shown them their own statistics. They start listening when it becomes a press issue. They start listening when people don't go away. They start listening when we stand up and we talk and we hold them accountable for their words. It's the season of diversity reports and yeah, <laughs> Apple just released theirs and that was more progress for them. Uh, people are going to, con uh, companies are going to continue to release theirs and hold them accountable. Tweet them if you're not satisfied. The great part about being an engineer is that you run tech. They can't do this without us. And they can't do it without the women, without the people of color. And this is why it's so important to keep putting it out there and saying, I am an engineer. And I don't look like the 75% white and Asian male at Facebook or at Google. Or, you know, I don't look like, you know, the board of directors at most every tech company. You know, you guys are running this. I told you it was going to get a little personal, sorry. Um, <laughs> last but not least, uh, I have met more engineers of color and women in the last month, excuse me, last 12 months than I have in the last 12 years. That is amazing. Where have you all been? <laughs> it, it is. I, I look around, I wake up in the morning, and I look at my Twitter, and I see you tweeting. I, I, I look at, you know, Erica, who's coming up here now, and it's just amazing. I mean, I remember working with Erica at Google, and, you know, just like, and I remember, saw, because I've seen her tweets, I was like, I know her. And then I found an email from her from, like, 2008. You know, in my, I'm like, well, oh, she emailed me in 2008. Um, so, <laughs> so she probably can remember why. So, um, but you guys are the future of tech, and you keep the pressure on. Keep people remembering that you're engineers, even if you're not trained, even if they're telling you you're not an engineer. You are all engineers, and you're all damn good engineers. Thanks. <laughs>